Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, wherever you are based in. And we are sorry for this delay in starting this webinar. Uh, there are some technical difficulties on the part of Professor Ahn, who is unable to join us uh, currently. Maybe he will be joining us later on. But uh, welcome to all of you for this webinar. And we are delighted to have you participating and registering for this webinar. Uh, on behalf of uh, Stockholm Center for South Asian and Indo-Pacific Affairs uh, at the Institute for Security and Development Policy, we welcome you for this uh, uh, webinar titled uh, uh, Pivotal States, Minilateralism and Indo-Pacific, Positioning India and South Korea. Let me begin by saying that, um, you know, since the election um, has happened in South Korea, and since the arrival of the new South Korean president, uh, President Yoon Sung Kyol, he has been promoting a lot of the dialogue of uh, the concept of global pivotal states in the South Korean foreign policy. And today we could see a lot of foreign policy activism is uh, visible in South Korean foreign policy in its external outreach and in collaborative uh, uh, measures with the foreign partner countries. Uh, in fact, today we could see that the South Korean foreign policy has become very, very active. It is having an Indo-Pacific strategy. It is focusing a lot with uh, many like-minded countries in the regions, uh, particularly with middle powers like India and Japan. The relationship with Japan is improving. The relationship with India is going to the next level, even though we know for a fact that there is no definition of clarity on the middle power configuration, but there are many issues which are emerging in South Korean foreign policy in the Indo-Pacific regions, which is bringing South Korea closer to many, many, many of the countries in the regions, including with India. At the same time, we are also seeing that South Korea is getting uh, involved institutionally and multilaterally through various minilateral platforms and through various um, uh, multilateral platforms with countries in the ASEAN regions, particularly in the Southeast Asian regions, and also including in the countries uh, in Europe uh, through the EU framework. And that's a positive sign. But what we are also seeing that among these partners, uh, if one partner which is emerging as a critical you know, partner to South Korea today in the Indo-Pacific regions, that is, uh, uh, that is South Korea. So South Korea is having a lot of uh, you know, uh, collaborative measures with India and uh, the South Korea-India relationship is making a steady progress uh, at many levels. Um, in fact, from India's point of view, there is a concept which is uh, doing uh, a lot of discussions and uh, you know, uh, in the intellectual circuit and in the official circuit, there is a promotion of the concept of global South. And so therefore, Today in this webinar, we'll try to debate it out what really constitute the global uh, pivotal states means from South Korean point of view. How does India look at it? What does a global South proposition means to India? And how South Korea should perceive, uh, perceive this concept? And how the India-South Korea relationship can be progressing? Uh, or is there a scope to progress within this pivotal or global south frameworks that we are today talking about? In order to discuss that, we have actually, um, you know, uh, quite a number, a number of, uh, you know, uh, well-known scholars who have written on this subject, who have, you know, promoted not only the Korean foreign policy issues, but also the India-Korea partnership for uh, many years. And for first, um, you know, Delighted to introduce Professor Chung Yong An, um, who has just recently joined, and uh, I, I believe he has resolved the technical difficulties. And we are sorry uh, that uh, Professor An, you had this uh, little bit of uh, technical glitches that always happens um, when when everything is online today. But uh, we are glad to have you, Professor An. And just as a um, you know, as a medium of introduction, actually Professor An does not need any introduction in the sphere of Korea and your relationship. Uh, he is a distinguished professor at the Graduate School of International Studies at the Chungwan University Seoul. He was actually a co-chair of the Korea-India Strategic Dialogue um, organized by the Seoul International Forums, which has been the flagship forum for many years in promotion of India-Korea partnerships. Previously, 
Professor Ahn was um, also chairman at the Korea Commission for Corporate Partnerships. Uh, he has also been, uh, you know, the president of the uh, KIE, which is also a prominent uh, economic think tank in, in Korea. And he has, uh, you know, for many years, Professor Ahn has been writing on India-Korea relationship. He has been a strong advocate that there has the Korea-India relationship should be the partnership of 21st century in Indo-Pacific. Uh, glad to have you, Professor Ahn. Uh, and he will be delivering a keynote speech. But before that, let me briefly also introduce some of our other prominent panelists who have actually worked on these issues. They are very well-known Korea hands and Indo-Pacific hands. Um, I'm glad to introduce Professor Jeffrey Robertson, who is well-known um, as, as a prolific writer. He is currently as an associate professor, um, you know, working uh, in at the Department of Diplomatic Studies in the UNSI University. Uh, in fact, before academia, he, uh, Professor Robertson actually worked for the Australian government in the field of diplomacy, foreign policy, and uh, Northeast Asia. His research in, uh, interest includes diplomatic practice and foreign policy of middle powers with a focus of North Asia and Korean Peninsula. He's actually, to my knowledge, if I'm not wrong, uh, Professor Robertson, he's actually working on a uh, book project on pivotal state and uh, it would be a you know um, a wonderful session uh, perhaps to listen to him uh, his critical views I have, I'm, I'm I'm fortunate to read some of his finest columns uh, everywhere um, elsewhere uh, in the international forums then we are actually glad to have uh, uh, Dr. Ho Ching Ping who is actually a senior lecturer in strategic studies and international relations uh, she is from National University of Malaysia uh, she is current, uh, concurrently co-founder and co-convener of the East Asian International Relations Caucus Network. She is also an adjunct lecturer at the Malaysian Armed uh, Forces Defense College. She is in various uh, you know, journals and in the editorial uh, board members, most prominently with the AUP politics and uh, IR in Asia series. Um, and I equally, I had the Great privilege, in fact, reading one of our manuscript, um, which is forthcoming very soon uh, on the root list. Uh, and uh, my congratulation to her for this outstanding manuscript, which actually covers a lot about Korea's engagement with the, with the ASEAN regions, uh, dealing with some of the debates that we'll be discussing today. Welcome to you, Dr. Ho. Um, and I'm also fortunate to have our well-known name, uh, Professor uh, Wihil Peik who is an associate professor at the Department of Political Science and International Studies. Uh, professor Paik is actually deputy director at the UNSA Institute of North Korean Studies. He is also equally the director for Center for International Relations, Aerospace Strategy and Technology Institute at the UNSA University um, in, in Seoul. Um, currently, he is uh, on a sabbatical and he is a visiting fellow uh, in Paris with IRACM, which is a prominent uh, strategic and security think tank. He's also an adjunct professor at the uh, Bridge University in Brussels, uh, which is a very well-known university in, in Europe. Uh, glad to have you, Professor Peik, and uh, he actually has a lot of stronghold on the science and technology field. So probably it will be very interesting to hear him, how he is trying to connect the science and technology as a medium uh, in the India-South Korea partnership, particularly covering the aspects of pivotal states and global south proposition. Uh, welcome to you, Professor Pei. Uh, then we have our um, own Indian colleague um, um, and my dear friend, uh, Professor uh, Dattis Parulekar, who is, um, who is a senior faculty member at the uh, School of International Relations um, at, and Area Studies at the Goa University, um, which is a well-known tourist place in India. Uh, and Professor Parulikar is having a strong expertise on Indian foreign policy, on the maritime domain, and on a number of issues that deals with East Asian countries, including China, Japan, and Korea. He has been a visiting faculty in many prominent uh, Indian universities and abroad. Uh, most currently, he's been a visiting faculty at the National Defense Institute at the Naval War College, at the College of Defense Management, College of War, uh, Air Warfare, and also Army War College, National Defense College in India, which are the most prominent uh, you know, defense establishment colleges 
uh, and he has been continuously teaching and uh, giving lectures there. Uh, he has uh, written for ISDP on many occasions. You could read some of his papers on the ISDP website, but today he will be giving a more, you know, a perspective, um, Indian perspective covering the Global South proposition and how Global South and pivotal states we could connect in terms of India-South Korea partnership. Um, um, great to have you, Professor Parulikar and others. Uh, I myself, I'm Jagannath Panda. I'm heading the Indo-Pacific Center at the ISTP, and I'll be moderating this uh, seminar along with me on the technical side. We'll, uh, on the background, I have my colleagues, Ms. Anna Jamuth, who has been really backbone in organizing this seminar. So without any further delay, let me invite Professor Ahn to uh, you know, um, deliver his keynote speech, maybe. Uh, so Professor Ahn, we cannot hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, let me then uh, go to the panel members without any further delay. We will come back to you. Maybe you would like to connect again because there has been some technical problems on your side. Okay, so let me then first uh, talk to, uh, go, go to Professor Jeffrey Robertson. Uh, Jeffrey, um, the questions and the floor is yours. Uh, we asked a few questions. Maybe you could locate your presentations within those debates. Maybe five to seven or eight minutes maximum, and then we'll go to the other panels. Over to you, Jeffrey. Okay, um, so maybe I can uh, count this as a keynote speech in my um, university <laughs> accomplishments. Maybe not. Okay, so I've got 10 minutes, basically. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank ISDP for inviting me to give my views and also the Korea Foundation for sponsoring. Given the time frame, I'm going to be pretty brief and direct. Now, my position is quite different from everyone else in the panel, I'm sure. I find my views are often quite different, but I at least hope you find them interesting or at least stimulating. So I'm going to cover three areas. I'm going to touch on language, the global pivotal state concept, and then look at Korea-India relations and the particular challenge that I believe it faces. So I'll begin by stating that language is really, really important. Language is critical to diplomacy. It colors and contextualizes policy, but it also persuades and deceives. And this is what the global pivotal state is all about. It's a rhetorical frame. It's a scaffold. It shapes how individuals and social groups perceive, comprehend, and react to policy. Now, as academics, we probably shouldn't be sucked into squandering our precious time on trivial, pointless rhetoric, unless you're applying for funding where keywords are very important. So, in my opinion, the global pivotal state means nothing, nothing at all. I'll give you three reasons why we should be very circumspect in our take on the global pivotal state. First, it's Genesis. It derives from dubitable sources. Like many catchphrases used by Korean administrations over the years, it can be traced to the work of academics turned policymakers or advisors. Their ideas bubble up from graduate study. They appear intermittently in op-eds, uh, academic papers, social media posts. They touch the surface in an earlier administration. Then finally, they hit the sunlight and they're everywhere. But as is often the case with the initiatives of academics turned policymakers, there's a lot more form than substance. And this leads me to my second point, it's ambiguity. Academics routinely use international relations terms that pass language and time barriers with imperfect correlations. These terms can take on new meanings as they enter linguistic, cultural, and temporal settings. In particular, academic terms can take on completely different meanings in a policy setting. You can imagine some foreign policy expert in the presidential planning committee coming up with the idea, hey, let's call our foreign policy a pivot. And somebody else yells out, hey, why don't we add global in front of this? Policy planning occurs in a space which is highly, full of highly ambitious individuals. They compete. Semantics do not take precedence. These concepts twist and turn until the original meaning disappears. And that's how it is with the global pivot concept. The term pivot, once related to a state that took on importance because, just like in engineering, 
it acts as a point on which pressure can be applied and a fulcrum can alter the condition of a system. Pivots turn and herein lay the rationale to control them. So Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote a book in 1997 called The Grand Chessboard. He was referring to Korea as a pivot because of its sensitive location and its potentially vulnerable condition. So this is very far from what the current administration means when they talk about a global pivot. So at best, this means that the current term holds a degree of ambiguity. It allows individuals to hear what they want to hear. At worst, it means a global pivotal state only has meaning within the very narrow framework of the UN administration's diplomacy. And this leads to the third argument, duration or temporality. With five year terms in the presidential administration, a year of settling in at the beginning, a year of winding up at the end, policy action occurs within a relatively narrow time frame. Now you can squeeze a lot of global pivotal state, people-centered diplomacy or global career or any other rhetorical catchphrase into three years. But does it change anything? Maybe, maybe not. Does it change anything in the context of bilateral relations? No. Partners can't devise a policy response or build bilateral relations on the foundations of rhetoric alone. Rhetoric can draw more attention to the bilateral relation, but ultimately this attention is short-lived. It can distract attention from the long-term relationship and it can even breed cynicism. So where does this leave us with Korea-India bilateral relations? Well, to understand it, we've got to peel away the rhetoric of the global pivotal state. We've got to peel away the freedom, peace, prosperity, democracy, human rights, yada, 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 all the other key terms that have popped up all the time. What are we left with? The core long-term tenets of South Korea's foreign policy, the defense of the nation and the security of its citizens, the maintenance of prosperity and economic well-being in the context of an economy structured around a small number of highly dominant export-dependent conglomerates, and lastly, and I think more relevant in the Korean context, the pursuit of a capacity to support independent diplomatic action. So from this perspective, the UN administration's foreign policy hasn't really altered South Korea's long-term foreign policy trajectory. Rather than a pivot, the UN administration is more like a pendulum. Five years of the UN administration swung South Korea's foreign policy up to a height that strained relations with Japan and the US. The UN administration has restored those relations and it's swung back down to the equilibrium position, the long-term resting position. Now the UN administration will give energy to that pendulum and it will swing back up to the opposite arc, a maximum amplitude where relations with Japan and the US will get better and relations with China will further deteriorate. Then in the next administration, that pendulum will swing back down and there it will stay. Unless of course, the point of suspension, which the pendulum rests on actually moves. And well, in the example of increased tension in China-US relations, that's a whole nother story. Importantly, these core tenets are facilit facilitated by strong relations with India. There's weighty security, economic, diplomatic rationales to build stronger relations with India. And I'm sure Professor Ahn will go into detail of all the statistics here. So I won't be the dead horse. Suffice to say, the benefits of stronger relations with India are a given. We don't even need to think about it. South Korea knows this. South Korea has been pursuing, and Professor Ahn has you know, been uh, central to a lot of it, has been pursuing good rela better relations with India for the last 10 to 15 years. Every state in the region knows about getting better relations with India. The US knows it. It's currently almost like a dating game. There's a whole number of countries who are seeking to date India. They're all potential suitors. But the problem is South Korea faces a particularly challenge in this dating game. All the other states are coming to this dating game with a box of chocolates and a bunch of flowers. Korea doesn't have this. What I'm talking about is domestic constituency. 
So domestic constituency in a bilateral relationship relates to the willingness of individuals in the epistemic community, the foreign ministry, the executive, and the wider government to see the partner state as relevant, credible, and ideal. For many multicultural states, the Indian diaspora supports a perception of India as relevant, credible, and ideal. It's not insignificant that in all of his recent trips, Prime Minister Modi has undertaken and engaged, um, undertaken action and engaged with the diaspora communities. So unlike Southeast Asia, unlike the Pacific, unlike Europe, Canada, Australia, the United States, Korea lacks an Indian diaspora. So how can Korea overcome this? What's the likelihood that we can make South Korean foreign policymakers see India as relevant, credible, and ideal? Well, the answer lies in what Korea already does, but in a little bit of a twist. So South Korea is very good at two-way public diplomacy, sorry, one-way public diplomacy, promoting Korea overseas. It's not so good in two-way public diplomacy, promoting overseas countries within South Korea. This is what I call cohort building. You build cohorts of supporters of the relationship. So you can do it in education. You build up more university MOUs between the two countries, faculty exchanges, joint courses, joint degree programs. You have cohorts of students who are invested in the bilateral relationship. You build up people to people links, sister city relationships, cultural exchanges, working holiday programs, labor agreements. You have cohorts of voters and citizens who are invested in the relationship and support the relationship. And then you also build up policy exchanges, parliamentary exchanges, civil service, executive office, media and journalistic exchanges. So you have cohorts of policy professionals who not only support but work on the relationship. Building cohorts of students, voters, policy professionals will, over a number of years, drastically increase the number of individuals and policymakers who see India as relevant, credible, and ideal. This would do much more than dressing up the relationship in fanciful but meaningless rhetoric. To build the Korea-India relationship, we need to go beyond the rhetoric. And this is what us as academics should be doing. You know, we're up in our ivory towers, or we're meant to be. We have, or we're meant to have time to focus on the long term rather than jumping from one rhetorical spray to the next as policymakers do. Now, we've got to feel sad for all of the Korean policymakers at the moment because they've got the very difficult job of fitting global pivotal state into everything they do. Every new initiative or every old initiative will be rebranded with global pivotal state in the headliner. You know, they've got to do it for their key performance indicators. It's their job. But we as academics don't need to do this. We should not be facilitating the promotion of a single administration's rhetoric unless it's for funding, then you know, key words are important. But us academics should set a better example. We should be seeking to build the Korea-India relationship in the long term and looking at the challenges and the long-term building programs that can actually strengthen the bilateral relationship. And a really good example comes from Korea's relations with Central Asia. So it's had the same programs or very similar programs running for about 20 years now. These programs change their name with every administration, but they're all still running. So I do hope that the attention to the Korea-India relationship, the attention that it gets under the global pivotal state um, rhetoric and under the 50 year anniversary results in lasting programs. This is the most important thing. Thinking in the long term is much, much more important. I'll leave it there. That's 10 minutes exactly, not bad. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Those were excellent remarks. In fact, uh, uh, as a true academics, we could see your practical, critical views. And this is, uh, this is what uh, we were exactly looking for for the, for the discussion and all. But your points are very valid. And I think we should not, as an academic, we should not really take all those rhetorical, rhetorical concepts on its face value. And um, I also agree to, on your point that there is a narrow time frame for the promotion of this pivotal state concept. 
and how different it is from the global Korea concept. So I think I think your your views are pertinent enough for 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 the discussion. Without any further delay, let me go to Professor um, uh, Dr. Chiu Ping Ho. So Chiu Ping, uh, maybe you could share your views for seven to eight minutes, uh, and we are extremely sorry for these uh, technical glitches. Over to you, Chiu Ping. Yeah, no problem at all. So yeah, it happens. So I think my uh, presentation also began in a very similar way with uh, Jeffrey, in which uh, I also uh, interrogate what exactly does uh, pivot means. So I have a little uh, visualization to aid with uh, my presentation. So of which um, when we look at the physics, social sciences, and also in mechanic uh, studies, uh, pivot can mean to support a point that can support a balance or movement. And in a, a mechanic movement, it means that the point in which um, the other movement surrounding it, so it revolves around the center point. So as for social science, uh, in psychology and other studies, it actually means the process of taking things to a new place or a new direction. So when South Korea introduced itself as a global pivotal state, so which type of uh, pivotal role that it actually talks about? So when we look at um, the US-China um, in the world today, so much to do about with the Indo-Pacific strategy that South Korea also have right now stem from uh, the very earliest one is actually by um, Japan under Shinzo Abe's prime ministership back in 2016. So the U.S. also, um, under the Trump administration, launched their own free and open Indo-Pacific in 2017. And in um, competition with China's Belt and Road Initiative, they also launched the Blue Dot Network. So just not too long ago, I asked the diplomat whether the Blue Dot Network is still alive. So of which they say it is, but uh, it, it is not moving at all. <laughs> so this is why the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity or IPAF was introduced um, uh, by the uh, Biden administration. So as for China, they also came up with more initiative in recent years including the uh, Global Security Initiative, GSI, and also Global Development Initiative, GDI, which is not um, the same as BRI. So GDI is more on soft infrastructure, like digital connectivity. Belt and Road is more on the hard infrastructure, like physical connection through highways, railways, and such. So there are other countries uh, and regions that introduce their respective Indo-Pacific frameworks, some known it as policy, uh, Germany known it as policy guidelines. Netherlands um, is a non-government um, paper that introduced a brief uh, overview of what the country thinks about Indo-Pacific, the first to do so from Europe um, also, and followed by France Indo-Pacific strategy. EU's also on um, Indo-Pacific strategy in the same year, 2021. ASEAN, um, introduced outlook on Indo-Pacific. And there is a lot of um, discussion among the member states, especially between Indonesia and Singapore, if they want to use the word policy, strategy, or outlook. Or <laughs> So there is a, a heated debate uh, among the member states as well. What does it mean for us? So ASEAN decided to adopt uh, a more inclusive uh, definition of the region. US under Biden administration reintroduced Indo-Pacific strategy um, uh, early last year, followed by South Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy that we all uh, know very well. Um, also, um, one of the common traits across all of this um, strategy or policy framework is that they all um, have similar geographical framing with a slight variation and differences. So when we go back to the type of the pivot that we are looking at, right? So there is a quad with um, US, Japan, India, Australia forming the will uh, to rotate, to move the world or the region in a certain direction. So, and then there is a talk of quad plus with South Korea, Vietnam and the likes to be considered to be the plus. So does that mean um, uh, the global pivotal state are in the supporting role or in the case of trilateral cooperation, the revival of trilateral alliance cooperation between the United States and two Asian allies ROK and Japan. So again, South Korea is part of the wing in which US is actually the pivot, the fulcrum that uh, actually anchored 
the uh, hub and spoke system. So who is actually pivoting whom? So this is one of the question I think that we need to reflect upon when we talk about um, pivotal state. So, and how about India uh, reflect on this as well? And in the job economic spheres, so this is the outdated uh, uh, group of um, uh, TPP RCEP comparison in which US is no longer part of the TPP and it is now renamed as CPTPP. Um, China has applied to join CPTPP. And um, we can see at the middle, the pivotal states are actually Japan and um, Australia, New Zealand, and some other Southeast Asian countries. So they are core Southeast Asian countries that engage in almost all initiatives launched by other major powers. So um, this is uh, published by, uh, also slightly outdated, but very much relevant to um, argue um, uh, one of the main ideas here, um, written by uh, Capenelli and also Professor Tan Si Seng from Singapore. Um, so they identify that, and also together with Professor Terada uh, from Japan, um, they all think that ASEAN plus three, ASEAN with China, Japan, Korea, are actually the pivot, the focal point of all of the um, multi-layer and overlapping initiative introduced by different regional powers, including from the Europe. So um, does that mean the real pivotal uh, platform, for example, is actually ASEAN. So this is what the Southeast Asian um, uh, countries would like to argue for and believe so. So, but when it comes to the geostrategic strategic domain, uh, we can see that the world are now um, involved in several flashpoints. So from the top right, of course, there is the um, Korean Peninsula involving um, North and South Korea. And further south is the Taiwan Strait, which uh, very much talk about and the role of South Korea after introducing their Indo-Pacific strategy is, are they willing to extend assistance in case there is a breakout of conflict in the Taiwan Straits? So the answer so far has been reluctant. So I um, participated a um, Republic of Korean Navy's International Sea Power Symposium uh, just uh, um, a month ago. And when I asked the Admiral about the possibility of um, extending um, Korean Navy's reach to other maritime conflict points such as Taiwan Strait and also South China Sea, the answer is um, affirmatively not really because the main priority is still on the Korean Peninsula. It is still North Korea. So how can South Korea claim to be global pivotal state when they are reluctant to play a role in uh, the extended uh, region in which also immediately covers the Indo-Pacific region. And we, of course, cannot discount Indian Ocean region. And the most obvious is, of course, the India-Pakistan um, conflict, where, where with the uh, crisis emerged from time to time, mostly conventional, but with real um, nuclear uh, standoff, which can be dangerous as well. And um, as we now know also multiple European Indo-Pacific policy frameworks. So on the European side, there is an ongoing Russian-Ukraine war. And that conflict also uh, prompt us in the Asia um, uh, region to think about how it would affect the development or the escalation of conflict in Taiwan Strait and also South China Sea. So with that, I would like to bring uh, to uh, my, to drive home the main points that I would like to make about South Korea and India's foreign policy priorities. Is it still very much home-based? So Korean Peninsula and India, Pakistan in South Asia. So to what extent when they each participate in the multiple minilateral and multiple cooperation matter to each of them? So they both um, also deeply engage with ASEAN and each member state. So there exists already bilateral and also multilateral engagement between South Korea, ASEAN, and also India, ASEAN. However, um, the Indo-Pacific strategy and policy that they launched respectively, and India doesn't have a formal policy <laughs> framework for it, I think, because for India, Indo-Pacific is the given, it's natural. So um, I think there will be more complementaries, including with the US-China driven initiative come into the picture. So, um, so we all are trying to find our space in which uh, we are trying to maximize the benefits and trying to minimize the risk 
security uh, threat that we each face. And it is because of the um, multiple security risks that we have different priorities for that affect how we actually wanted to work with each other. So I uh, look forward to more discussion on this regard later. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much, Yopinga. I do agree with you. I think there is there are a lot of contradictions uh, on those slogans on in uh, on Indo-Pacific, the way South Korea looks at it, the way India looks at it, and most uh, importantly, there are contradiction in terms of the way we look at the pivotal state concept. Uh, and I think uh, most of your views complements um, Jeffrey's point of view. Uh, without any further delay, let me also invite. Uh, um, uh, uh, Wuhelpek, uh, Professor Wuhelpek, over to you, maybe five to eight minutes or uh, a little more, maybe eight to 10 minutes, uh, over to you. Okay, do you hear me? Okay, good. Yes. Well, you know, what I'm, what I'm supposed to do uh, today is uh, more India, South Korea, Korea, South Korea, India, in the cooperation in technology uh, and the opportunities and the challenges. And the, um, you know, I have given, you know, this task, you know, for, for discussing, you know, today, uh, and then I think it's Professor An and then the other, you know, discussion to be have uh, some more, uh, the broad, uh, the perspective on this bilateral relationship from the global pivotal post, uh, state perspective and global South initiative perspective. Uh, but in our focus more on technology and then, you know, move on to uh, a very brief, you know, assessment of the bilateral relationship. Uh, and then the India-Korea multifaceted relations have been, you know, developing last two decades. Um, since two, 2015, the bilateral relation has been upgraded, you know, to the strategy, uh, special strategic relations, you know, sharing most aspects of Indo-Pacific strategies and then making great efforts, you know, to overcome tyranny of, uh, you know, distance across Indo-Pacific ocean and continent. Uh, the two the countries' foreign ministers held a bilateral talk, you know, last you know April, uh, for the discussing more cooperation. Uh, and the Indian foreign minister Sagarasan uh, and uh, uh, described the the talks as a warm and wide ranging, and then noted in a steady progress on in our ties, discussed political contacts, and trade and investment, and defense and science, technology, energy, space, semiconductors, emerging technologies, and cultural exchanges. At the same time, his Korean counterpart, in front, uh, the Foreign Minister Park Jin said, we are both exemplary democracies, vibrant economies, and uh, you know, cultural powers, and we are both committed to contributing a free, open, peaceful, prosperous Indo-Pacific region. Uh, I think that's you know, basically bottom line of the global pivotal state strategy in the Indo-Pacific strategy of South Korea. They echo the, the goodwill and the potentials for tighter relation which ironically means that these two countries have reached their bilateral um, their potential a long time ago. So basically, you know, their bilateral relationship has been uh, you know, stagnant you know, for quite a bit. To be honest, uh, the bilateral cooperation's progress and across the policy dimensions, including that of science and technology, uh, has been disappointing. You know, despite uh, these two foreign ministers' warm exchange to the celebrate the 50th year anniversary of diplomatic relations and then to consolidate special strategic relations of the two Indo Pacific countries. This critical evaluation uh, and then, you know, criticism basically of their stagnant relations has been widely, but, you know, quietly shared from the strategic community in Seoul and in New Delhi. From a Korean point of view, um, those established top three enterprises, you know, Hyundai, Samsung, LG, which already become the key in-house brands in you know, India, are uh, the only economic and the technological presence of Korea in Indian territory. The other 700 Korean enterprises, more medium-sized enterprises, basically in India have been struggling to establish themselves, not to mention becoming a major economic and uh, technological player. Indian enterprises have not entered the Korean market, not to mention or co-developing any significant in technology product with the you know, Korean partners. As a result, the bilateral technological uh, cooperation has been minimal in comparison with each country's cooperation with the other party, the other countries. For example, with the United States, Japan, Russia, and then major you know, European countries. 
occasional encouragement uh, in the in lateral call uh, exchange from decision makers and strategic community, along with their science and technology authorities, do not the job. Uh, now we now uh, need uh, to change our approach from pure market economic principle to economic and then technology security orientation. As the two ministers com commonly state, even though the, the two countries have tried to co develop defense industry, space and shipbuilding, especially in submarine, bio, and so on, the market principles do not match such a state level intention last two decades. So the two countries need to consider the needs of science and technological cooperation as a co-evolution as serious security partners. Frankly speaking, India and Korea, and Korea and India haven't regarded each other as a serious security partner. In other words, in this era of a convergence of multi-dimensional securities, for example, military security, economic security, and the technological security and political regime security, and at the end of the day, environmental security. This convergence first, as well as the region convergence, the Indo-Pacific region and the euro antarctic region and beyond, they are converging. So the bilateral you know, technological cooperation should be taken as a security cooperation and co-evolution. This is a bold step forward for these two countries, you know, which have been uh, very cautious to limit their security horizons and their partnerships within their traditional you know, regions, South Asia and then you know, Northeast Asia, as well as the extended Indo-Pacific region. This time, uh, the time has come for them you know, to formulate the real security alignment uh, in the, the context of multi-dimensional security convergence, if not alliance. Uh, this is uh, just a uh, you know, change of fundamental structure in global political technological security convergence. Otherwise, um, their leadership rhetoric, as well as the strategic communist strong advice along with the uh, you know, vibrant but market really business community cannot take their technological cooperation up to another real level. Seoul and then New Delhi might you know, want to consider, to boldly consider something like the recently agreed facts if United States and India elevates strategic partnership with the initiative on critical and emerging technology. That's type of you know, agreement in the, at the very highest level. To be sure, the relation with uh, the United States in science technology cannot be identical with the depth between these two countries. But you know, at least you know they can try have uh, this type of you know approach. For example, India's most recent technological gain from the United States: co-production of jet fighter get, uh, gas turbine engine, which will substantially improve uh, the India's jet fighter technology, might be a good starting point. You know, Korea, who solely depends on importing the jet fighter engine. Uh, for the light jet fighter FA-50, as well as 4.5 generation jet fighter KF-21 from the United States, would be extremely interesting in joining this type of you know, technological project. The space technology cooperation should be on the table one more time. India joined the Artemis Accord this month, and then Korea is one of the key partners for the United States Red you know, Space Program. It is well known that India tried to make use of its space technology, especially space launch vehicle, to negotiate with Korea on many occasions. Now Korea, however, succeeded in this technological dimension with its own space launch vehicle duty and becomes a more equal partner to co-evolve in the space science and technology. In this case, the United States plays a, a significant role in the hosting these two countries' cooperation. I think this is a mini lateral approach, you know, that's suggested by the organizer, you know, Dr. Zagras Panda. In, a, in other words, if there are structural reasons for the slow progress in the bilateral framework, a different type of approach is needed. Korea and India need to seek mini lateral approaches too. Currently, global major science and technology cooperation among the major powers is carried out in the form of mini lateral or and or multilateral rather than bilateral. So most of the science and technology fields and an item that Korea and India mutually desire are well known, even though it is necessary to discover new fields such as renewable energy. Uh, and however, this approach should be taken in the context of a technology 10 countries such as the United States, Japan, 
European countries such as Germany, Sweden, the uh, United, uh, the the France, and then UK and then Italy and Spain and China, and then potentially later on after the end of the war between Europe and Russia, and then Russia in the science technology ecosystem, rather than looking at each other in isolation and independence. Korea is one of the top 10 in technologically advanced countries and India has its own technological strength for sure. And that's all in New Delhi should seek you know, ways to advance into third regions and the countries together or to attract the investment technology transfer together. Uh, it is necessary to select you know, which countries can be targeted for the mini and multilateral cooperation in science technology diplomacy with the uh, India in each field. The bottom line is how these two upper middle power countries, we don't need to exaggerate, you know, state capacity of these countries, but you know, they are up there uh, and it's bilateral mineral relations to another level. We all know that it hasn't been up to the high expectation in terms of conventional terms. So we had better engage in a, more, a new form with the aforementioned multi-dimensional as well as in Indo-Pacific and Euro-Atlantic regional convergence. We can think about more like alliance after you know, alignment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, those were really interesting remarks. And I think one key point I'll be taking from your presentation is that we need to be practical. I think there are a number Sorry, of areas can, where- can I Try again. Can you hear me now? Yes, Professor Ahn, we can hear you. We'll come back oh. to you later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We will come back to you. So, Professor um, uh, Ahn, we will come back to you later. Um, uh, kindly wait for uh, 10 minutes more after Professor Parulekar speaks, then we'll come back to you. But we have an interesting point. I think in your presentation, there is one critical point emerging where you are realistic about this cooperation and you are suggesting that uh, there are uh, many critical areas, uh, particularly in the space technologies, in uh, defense technologies, particularly when you mentioned about the jet fighter technological collaborations, there is a lot of promise are there between India and South Korea, which could happen, but we need to be very realistic how to position this partnership ahead. Uh, we will come back to you, uh, Wuhel, with a few comments and questions. Um, in the meantime, what I would request uh, for the participants who are hearing us, please, uh, post your question um, and uh, if you have any comments or questions in the q and a box for our speakers you could address the speakers names and they they will address your questions uh, we will come back to the discussions after professor parulekar and professor Ahn speaks but first i will invite professor parulekar to uh, share his presentation for seven to eight minutes maybe over to you that is yeah thank you am i audible Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jagannath, and thank you to ISDP for uh, you know convening this particular uh, session and for inviting me alongside my distinguished colleagues. Let me get straight to the topic. Uh, I'm going to look at it basically in terms of three sections. As point of view, how does South Korea's global pivotal state concept resonate in Delhi? The second is to look at some of the features of India-Korea economic relations and how this relation, and third, and third is to be, and third is to be able to understand how is India and South Korea positioning itself for the global South. Let me come to the first point. From India's point of view, uh, the current administration's global pivotal state concept essentially has five features. The first is moving from passivity to proactive performance. And I think this is something that one can see, one can very much understand because the current administration of Yoon Suk Yeol has not only argued for a global pivotal state, but diplomatic initiatives are also showing that they're trying to put their money where their mouth is whether it's in terms of Park Jin's visit to India or in terms of the president's visit to Vietnam, the visit to Washington, trying to develop relations with Australia. So it's clear that they're trying to move out of a certain degree of passivity and moving into proactive performance. The second is moving away from what we call as geographically hemmed to being geographically delimited. And I can understand this because for a long time, India's foreign policy also suffered from the syndrome. 
a lot of the oxygen was you know taken out by pakistan where our day began with pakistan and our day in foreign policy ended with pakistan and for the last 9 years in particular we've seen how we've been able to transcend the pakistan challenge and able to position india's interests as a global power and if south korea is finally looking to get beyond the korean peninsula existentialism and transcend that and position south korea as a global power i think it is definitely a welcome development the third is the diversification element and again i see commonalities between india's thrust on diversification and south korea's diversification of partnerships because this is not only about socialization this is about a global pivotal state wanting to actually be an entrepreneurial state so the partnerships are not for symbolism the partnerships are to be built around values and interests in an entrepreneurial manner the fourth is for a long time south korea was understood in terms of its security competencies it has not done flag and brandish the economic and technological components of its diplomacy nationally and internationally but you are seeing that economic and technological components are going to be the underpinnings to a global pivotal state concept of south korea and that certainly has certain pluses but the most important thing is the last point which is you can't be taken as a serious actor in the indo pacific unless you are con I think we lost Professor Parulikar for a moment here. So, Professor Parulikar, are you there? I was really hanging out for that last word. I was just just waiting for it. Yes, yes. So I think uh, again. Oh, he has connected. He has reconnected. So just. Dates, can you hear us? Please unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I lost you for a couple of minutes because we have some rains here. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, uh, your last. So point the last that South Korea is now. You can hear me now. Yeah, I have unmuted. You can hear me now. Can you uh, can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. I'm sorry, there was some uh, you know rains here, so that we have some problems here. so the fifth point really is in terms of south korea contributing to the regional public goods concept and this is something very important because south korea as a global pivotal state is moving away from simply being present to being relevant in strategic terms in the region so how do we look at the second component which is about india korea economic relations there's no doubt that even though there is an uptake in trade figures trade figures is not everything just as gdp is not the only measure of how well a country is growing trade figures are one aspect but we have to look at the broader strategic elements of economic engagement and here i do believe that for a long time india korea relations since sepa was enacted has remained focused on the transactional while not really while missing out on the strategic the market exposure focus has been more in this relationship so both sides talk about each other's companies getting market exposure but there's not enough talk about how these companies should invest in each other's landscapes and connect with the small and medium sector enterprise ecosystems in those countries so which is why india has complaints that chai that korean companies do come into india but are not connecting with the small enterprises in india in terms of local sourcing and the same problem happens with indian companies who are only looking to trade but are not looking necessarily at the investment situation Korea has missed out an opportunity to become an economic stakeholder in the India growth story and i say this of four elements to uh, entities in the world who have done this japan united states uh the european union and asean all four of these are socio economic and economic technological partners of india because they have bought into the india story in very different ways the united states is part of a very broad sheet of strategic capacitation of india in terms of japan they are very much iconic in terms of the infrastructure building within india 
when it comes to the european union they are very much again iconic in terms of development partnerships with india and in india for sustainable development and of course asean countries particularly the big 3 big 4 have also bought into the india story in terms of investing in indian infrastructure korea in a sense needs to embody all these four and yet be a bit of all of these four so how can that happen the first thing is we have to move to convergences on two important concepts one is national self reliance and one is strategic resilience both of these put together are a winning partnership for countries such as india and south korea because on national self reliance and strategic resilience india brings the challenge proposition south korea has the potential to provide the solution so you have the proposition and you have the solution if they can meld and merge together then this can not only be an important concept in their own partnership but these are the two important concepts for the global south as well so what am i meaning by national self reliance and strategic resilience semiconductors fintech health and biosciences and the blue economy i think if we can build clusters around these four there's a lot of mutual learning that we can have between ourselves and each of these are not just political signals they are also important business opportunities for sunrise private businesses because we all realize that no matter what the polit pol you know policy makers do as joe biden and you know modi said recently it is for the private sector to actually walk the talk if the relationship has to move forward so actually the focus has to be on moving out of simply a foreign ministers dialogue strategic dialogue to having more line ministry dialogues if we have 60 dialogue mechanisms with us and almost you know 25 30 dialogue mechanisms developing with the eu there needs to be more sectoral line ministry dialogues so that we can judge india south korea economic relations and contribution on the basis of optimal outcomes another important point we talk of high tech transfer but picking from what jeffrey robertson said i'm talking of human tech transfer what india has been doing of late and in fact india is doing this with a lot of its economic partners because there has been a problem in trying to accommodate india's necessities for you know free movement of 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 uh, you know human services we are now signing migration and mobility pacts we did this recently with australia this is something like an addendum to the economic partnership agreements that you have we could think in terms of actually trying to build a low hanging mobility and migration pact which is an addendum to sepa right now sepa is stuck in all kinds of transactional dialogues we could move the ball forward by talking in terms of what a migration and mobility pact could do i'm going to just talk about three or four more issues and i'm going to start how does india and korea as potentially global the carry no historical baggage between themselves and they don't carry historical baggage into the global south as well so there is a lot of room and latitude for credibility and credibility is a big issue in modern times there is also the importance of french shoring and trust shoring while we may look at the logic of interest countries are defining their interests on the basis of certain common values and french shoring trust shoring has becoming important india and south korea again don't have problems if they can build dialogues over the next few years they can help to build greater trust and move collectively into the global south then i would like to place two figures before you the first is as india's you know economy grows the projection is that 50% of india's export gdp is moving east of india and that is why india's act east is such an important anchor for india but as this is true there is another trade flows are going to happen across asean and they will move to the west of asean which is as i'm talking largely africa and to a periphery these two statistics are taken into account what they suggest is that is a very sweet spot for intersection between india and korea 
because because of this india will continue to move east I would focus more on south asia and african littoral of india pacific as as india focuses more on asean and to the east of asean on east asian uh, you know societies the last two points is both india and korea have a a, a particular interest in shaping a plural indo pacific of course on different terms south korea is much more calibrated and nuanced when it comes to how to pluralize the indo pacific but it's very clear that south korea has its own equities if the indo pacific is pluralized so how do you pluralize the indo pacific you could do that either in terms of a security you know kind of a complex which is reductionist to which south korea is not going to buy into it but you could do it on the lines of a geo economic agenda and that's why i see that when Pre when president yoon suk yeol says that south korea would like to engage with the quad even be part of a quad plus he's not talking of a geopolitical quad he is talking of a geo economic quad because quad since 2021 since it's elevated to the summit level has been very clear to you know to separate the security dialogue from the economic dialogue and most of the time the summit meetings which are happening are covering geo economic topics uh, of of national security and south korea has a stake in it the last point is with which i will conclude there is no overarching multilateralism axis in the indo pacific there can't be one as long as there is a duality and a dichotomy of strategic nature between us and china you will not get one overarching multilateral mechanism so in the absence of a overarching multilateral mechanism what can india and south korea do to find traction within the region they obviously have to focus on minilaterals and here both sides have the ability not to drive a minilateral right now but at least to be part of minilaterals so where both countries come to the table and make it very functional it will provide them autonomy it will provide them strategic flexibility and more importantly it will allow them to be able to provide for public goods that will in turn over time make them pivotal states in the indo pacific thank you very much thank you professor prek uh, those were excellent remarks in fact last two points were very interesting how both india and korea are having plural indo pacific notions in their foreign policy in different terms and there is no overwhelming multilateral uh, multilateralism which binds india and south korea together in an identical form and i think these two points are very critical when we are talking about india south korea cooperation in indo pacific without further delay because we will be discussing we have some time for the discussion without further delay let me invite again professor an if we could hear you uh, this time maybe you could unmute yourself and come and read your speech do not wait for the powerpoint just go ahead and present yourself just speak we can hear you yes uh, your powerpoint is already there so please go ahead okay hey jagan can you hear me now yes very much please okay, go ahead okay very good excellent uh, you know gentlemen and uh, dr who I really feel sorry for the all the confusion you know I had gone through. Well, uh, basically I am economist by training, and uh, maybe I may raise more questions than answers on the security uh, e economic nexus. Okay, uh, next next page, please. Excellent. Next page. Uh, December last year, South Korea's Yoon Suk-yeol government declared its own Indo-Pacific strategy uh, on the basis of three core values: freedom, peace, prosperity. First two components you're familiar with all this, and here let me emphasize the pro prosperity component uh, is basically a, a inclusive a prosperity uh, on the basis of the resilient supply chain extended economic security and uh, economic technology ecosystem uh, basically the korea added a inclusive prosperity component to the us led indo pacific strategy which emphasized the freedom of navigation and the rule based open system next one uh i think the previous speakers touch up on uh, the the uh definition on the global pivotal state here uh the yunsung yeol government uh, really has shifted 
developed from strategic ambiguity, which prevailed during Moon Jae-in administration to strategic clarity in conformity with the Comprehensive Value Alliance with the United States. Uh, toward China, Korea will pursue a principles diplomacy on the basis of mutual respect and de-risk its supply chain linkages by reducing Korea's excessive dependence on China through active uh, the participation of the RCEP, CPTPP, and the bilateral free trade deals, uh, for example, the Korea-India SEPA. In particular, according to Korea's Indo-Pacific construct, uh, ASEAN and India are really targeted for post-China destinations. Uh, Global pivotal state could be the, the viewed from the hegemonic power or unilateral influence in international relations. But here I would like to define a global pivotal state can be a, a state which participates very actively in international architecture to make a very constructive proposals. Uh, and uh, to work on the uh, cross-country you know, coordination to achieve that the constructive proposal. Uh, in this regard, as a near top 10 economy in the world, Korea intends to outreach more actively ASEAN, India, EU, even Latin America, African countries, beyond a traditionally focused Korean Peninsula and the surrounding four, four powers. Well, Korea is already one of the most free trade agreement to rely on the economies and intends to contribute global norms and public goods through actively and simultaneously participating in minilateral and multilateral institutions to realize security and common prosperity across the nations. And uh, the last point here uh, on the global pivotal state, Korea as a rising soft power intends to share its development experiences and knowledge with developing world, especially in the global south with increased ODA resources. Next, please. You know, here, you see, uh, you know, in the quest of the Korea's global pivotal state, we need to uh, see a global supply chain reconfiguration and the structural changes. Uh, pandemic and uh, the war in Ukraine uh, already caused a supply chain disruption to make a wake up call the importance of the supply chain resilience. Uh, so this is uh, a, an, one aspect of the security trade nexus. Then the US-China technology rivalry has further aggravated the deglobalization trend uh, to result in geoeconomic fragmentation to hinder a needed supply chain resilience. This is another dimension of security trade nexus. Then we see here new paradigm shift uh, from the just in time strategy with no inventory to just in case strategy with inventory accumulation, which invo is invoking a reassuring, reassuring, and friendly sharing with the very heavy subsidies from the government. Uh, then the, the trade and the economic landscape in the uh, Indo Pacific will depend on how the US high tech guardrails against China vis-a-vis -vis a Chinese self-sufficiency in high tech will unfold in the years come, to come. Next, please. Here we can see a bunch of the mini lateral, the multilateralism in the Asia Pacific. The quick question is that these institutions will converge or diverge in the years to come. Many of these institutions are motivated to secure supply chain resilience under security trade nexus. And uh, you know, US is turning to inward looking protectionism. And in response, China shifted to nationalistic self-sufficiency strategy in high-tech areas. Both US and China are playing 
high tech hegemony gain at the expense of smaller and less powerful economies. And furthermore, all these architectures interact with each other to result in geoeconomic fragmentation in post pandemic uh, global value chain. At the worst narrative, uh, are we heading to Kindleberg trap or even to Kittitas war? Here, my position is that we should work on a strategic convergence of a bunch of these minilateral and uh, multilateral mechanisms. Next page, please. You know, economic security here as an economist, uh, we can see a bunch of the different definitions, but the, here I would like to define a given today's complex system of international trade and mutual interdependence, supply chain resilience post pandemic is the most important component of economic security by minimizing unintended or intended disruptions of cross-border movement of intermediate goods and uh, critical materials. So I would like to argue the, the various collaborations uh, uh, between India and Korea uh, in this context. Next, please. You know, Korea has involved very heavily in global value chains. If you look at the statistics over the past two decades, the portion of Korea's intermediate goods in the its export structure consistently rose from 60% in 2010 to 74% in 2022, while capital goods export went down from 29 to 13%. So this clearly indicates that Korea has very heavily involved in the linkage integration with trading partners, especially with the ASEAN 10 members. Next, please. Korea, you know, if you look at the our Input structure, it again clearly indicate that Korea tends to import raw materials and you know, low end or medium and intermediate inputs, process them and export, involving a very strong backward linkage integration to make a complete the active circular supply chain links. So this is the backbone of Korea's outward-looking development in its uh, expansion in the Indo-Pacific strategy. Next, please. You, here you can see that Korea's dominant trading partners uh, uh, has been you know, occupied by China in 2022. Uh, trade volume with China, they shared 22%, uh, and by the US, uh, 14 percent, and then Vietnam, Vietnam by 36 percent, Japan uh, 6 percent, you know, so forth. India uh, shared only uh, 1.9 percent. So still, uh, the linkage with the India's in terms of the trade relationship is not really significant. Although India belongs to a top 10 trading partners for Korea. Next, please. Here in the quest of the Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy, I would like to point out that the Korea is ready to join highest standard, the CPTPP. Uh, as you know well, UK was accepted as a new member on March 23. China, Taiwan also submitted applications. Other batch of interested entrants include Korea, Indonesia, Thailand, and Philippines. Cambodia, et cetera. So uh, we are going to submit formally a membership application to CPTPP. Uh, we should recognize that the backbone of the CPTPP was based on the Korea-US Free Trade Agreement effective 2012 and amended in 2019. So uh, existing members of CPTPP welcome a Korea's entry to CPTPP. Next, please. You know, I want to talk about the RCEP effectuation, uh, which uh, occurred in January last year. 
Uh, indeed, the RCEP effectuation served as sort of silver lining in the clouded regional and economic outlook amid pandemic caused supply chain disruptions and uh, rising protectionism. Uh, it is you know, highly significant for China, Japan, Korea formally to be connected the first time in the plurilateral free trade agreement and the first time for Korea and Japan on the same umbrella of the RCEP. And uh, RCEP, uh, however, lacks chapters on labor, environment, and investor state dispute settlement clause and substitute to state owned enterprises as contained in CPTPP. As a result, far lower is shallow than CPTPP in liberalization of tariff and non tariff barriers. But you know, I want to emphasize a unified rules of origin and self authentication are very significant for the uh, regional small and medium enterprises of which you know emphasized uh, by the early speakers next please you know trade linkage between the cjk and asean and uh, if you look at here the intra regional trade linkage among china japan and korea uh, and the uh, intra regional linkage among the asean 10 members uh, have decreased in the past two decades. However, in the RCEP wide economies, uh, the intra regional trade linkage have increased quite substantially. So, trade linkage between CJK and ASEAN has increased by sheer market forces to cause a trade and FDI diversion from non RCEP economies. The effectuation of the RCEP deal is likely to trigger a new momentum to increase the, this trend even further. Uh, unfortunately, the India is not a member of the RCEP, and I hope the India will come to join the RCEP uh, rather soon. Next, please. In the Pacific economic framework, you know, among like-minded countries, I think we need to pay attention on this mechanism. Uh, of course, this is uh, a Biden's, President Biden's initiative in response to the effective RCEP as well as CPTPP, uh, but here does not address with the market access issue to the US and in fact, de facto containment policy against China uh, consists of the four pillars, uh, resilient supply chain, digital trade rules, decarbonization and anti-corruption. Each of the IPEP members can select uh, one of those four fillers. And I understand that the India has not joined the resilient supply chain you know, component. And at the moment, I think the 12 members joined the, the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And uh, since India has also joined this uh, umbrella, uh, Rock and India can initiate uh, various action-oriented programs such as digital trade and uh, decarbonization areas. Next, please. And then, you know, I want to talk about middle powers, including India and uh, Korea. Uh, I think should be able to raise our own voices uh, uh, with some strategic autonomy. Uh, to search for a third way to call for a open rule-based liberal system uh, while playing an, an honest broker between the US and China rivalry. And uh, I think the, you know, Rock and India uh, uh, as middle power should express concerns against the, the US unilateral guardrails to control flows of high tech product and equipment based on the very convenient usage of the security trade nexus logic. Uh, I think the, we need an agreement on the definition of security trade nexus. Where is the demarcation line between the you know, dual technology, I mean, military technology and the civilian technology. So for example, security sensitive semiconductors and the tradable legacy semiconductors, uh, you know, who, who drew the line, the US 
unilaterally make decision and uh, you know inform us to follow the the criteria. I think that we need to have some you know uh, the agreeable the, the, the definition on this, and uh, then middle powers, including Iraq and India, should raise our own voices against China's unilateral and coercive actions such as freezing on cultural product flows and unequal treatment for foreign investors, you know, which violate the non-discrimination principles. So in transition, middle powers, including Korea and India, need to initiate unilateral digital trade agreement of depot type and, and work for multilateralism by reviving the stalled WTO. After all, you know, we should recall that APEC and CPTPP uh, has been triggered by a very small group of these small power, small and medium powers at the sideline of the, the international meetings. And uh, middle powers need to work out strategic collaborations to secure strategic materials to prepare for the weaponization, especially by China and other the, the, uh, countries which own a strategic materials. Next, please. And uh, here, let me take a look at the Iraq India Special Strategic uh, Partnership, where two countries perform at this point. Uh, Korea India bilateral trade need to pick up a new momentum. Uh, look at the data between the, the trade volume and uh, Korea's outbound foreign direct investment uh, in comparison with the Vietnam. And the trade volume with the India uh, over the past several years, uh, roughly about the, uh, 20 or 30 percent of the trade volume between India and Vietnam. But if you look at the outbound Abound a foreign direct investment figures uh, is the striking difference right there between India and Vietnam. Uh, Korea's outward foreign direct investment to Vietnam is, you know, about 10 times the higher than those to India in case of 2019. And so why, how can you explain, you know, this difference? I think the degree of open door policy and the business environment, including incentive system between Vietnam and India have made the difference. Uh, you know, as you know well, the Vietnam has joined CPTPP as well as uh, RCEP and has provided a very lucrative uh, uh, the, the, the incentive systems for incoming foreign investors. Uh, therefore, India-Korea bilateral economic contact have not reached yet full potential, requiring to get closer from still existing a long distance feeling each other. India is likely to become soon the third largest economy in the world with the most populous and youngest population structure under a democratic market economic system. I think this South Korea is recognizing the rising India uh, in, in this aspect. Next, please. And, uh, you know, I want to talk about the roadmap to maturity uh, between the Iraq and India special strategic partnership. This year marks the 50th anniversary of diplomatic tie. Given the highly complementary industrial structure, uh, the bilateral trade is likely to reach uh, $50 billion by 2030. And by further upgradation of the SEPA between India and Korea, we'll allow to reach $50 billion even before 2030. Economic Development Cooperation Fund, this is very good news of over US $1.9 billion for an intelligent transportation system on the Nagar Mumbai Super Communication Expressway project in Delhi is likely to trigger various SOC projects, which India needs very urgently. And in 2020, India and Korea signed a roadmap for 
defense industry cooperation, which seems to me are very much promising for a future collaboration between two countries. Maritime collaboration on top of the uh, a naval exercise between two countries can further develop in the area of shipbuilding, prevention of the maritime marine pollution, anti-piracy, anti-terrorism, anti-trafficking, and public health, etc. So strategic priority industrial cooperation between two countries need to focus on defense industry first and AI, bio, R&D, and the semiconductor as uh, uh, Dr. Datesh you know, emphasized. Ongoing the Korea-India bilateral collaboration cooperation project uh, should be upgraded to the level of India-Japan cooperation by accumulating a mutual trust and the actual the, the, uh, development project will allow the uh, India and Korea to search for a trilateral cooperation mechanism between Korea, Japan, and India. And another trilateral route would be Korea, ASEAN, and the in India link will further the, the accelerate a regional growth. And therefore, regular summit between two plus two ministerial meetings need to be established. Okay, next please. Uh, Korea's homework toward inclusive and prosperous uh, in the Pacific, as I said before, Korea should join the most advanced high standard CPTPP as soon as possible. And uh, Korea also str strengthens strategic ties with the ASEAN and India and outreach Africa and Latin America to share Korea's development experience. And uh, then Korea also should play a role of upgrading the recently effective RCF to introduce new chapters on labor environment and investor state dispute subsidy issues to state-owned enterprises to get closer to CPTPP's high standard for eventual amalgamation of two megadeals, namely with CPTPP and uh, RCEP. And uh, Korea also should search for diversification of resilient supply chains of strategic materials from heavy China dependence and work for uh, mini leather initiative for decarbonization, digital trade, and uh, anti-corruption rules as contained in the Pacific Economic Framework and the partly in the RCEP. Korea also need to ensure to enhance trade foreign direct investment nexus and install an aftercare service system for inbound foreign direct invested companies. Next one, final one. And uh, I think in this regard, India and also need to carry on some homework toward inclusive and prosperous Indo-Pacific. I would like to see that India to speed up joining the RCEP as the door is open. Trade and investment divergent effect from non-RCEP members are likely to come. To overcome uh, this uh, divergent issue, I think it is very highly urged India to join RCEP. Uh, India's innocence opted out at the last round of RCEP negotiation tends to defame India's determination to advance an open economic system. And uh, then India as a formidable middle power needs to work together with uh, Korea for revival of WTO by urging to appoint judges for appellate body and in transition should join a multi-party interim uh, the, uh, arbitration system. And uh, India, Korea should move on a new plateau of bilateral cooperation to strengthen strategic ties with ASEAN and India and uh, outreach Africa and Latin America uh, together to share its development experience. Uh, the last two points, I think I, I made some typos here. Uh, India and the Korea should search for a diversification, resilient supply chains, a strategic 
materials post-China and decarbonization, digital trade, anti-corruption rules in Indo-Pacific economic framework. Here again, India, uh, Korea should ensure to enhance trade FDI nexus and install an aftercare services for inbound foreign direct investors. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Professor Han, uh, thank you very much for a very informative, elaborative, and comprehensive presentation. And I think uh, your uh, uh, presentation is on the roadmap that India and the ROK needs to find a lot of commonality in order to advance the partnerships. And I do agree with you that the supply chain resilience is very critical to the economic security that we are talking about. Also, um, when you talked about uh, the defense industrial cooperation, focusing on industry, artificial intelligence, semiconductors, these are the areas where both these bilateral part, you know, countries, bilateral partnership could be really beneficial, particularly taking the momentum that is building both in India and South Korean foreign policy. Uh, and also at the end, you suggested that India should return back to the RCEP. I do not know whether that is practically feasible and how early that uh, India could really return back to the RCEP. But definitely, this is something I think many of the uh, you know, policymakers in Delhi and elsewhere, they are discussing that whether India could realistically return to uh, the RCEP um, multilateral frameworks in the Indo-Pacific regions. But these are, these are very interesting remarks and I'm sure we'll have many uh, points to discuss further. I could see already in the Q&A box, there are some comments and questions coming up. So probably most of you have already answered, but maybe for the, you know, um, for the benefits of our viewers who are watching and listening to us via Facebook and YouTube, uh, maybe um, I would uh, request all the panelists to address some of these comments. So maybe um, first I'll request maybe Jeffrey to you to take some of these questions and comments in the Q&A box into account and also comment on others panelists, what they have said and what they have not said, where you agree and do not agree, um, including uh, some of your remarks if you would like to revisit or strengthen or put forward further. So maybe each one of you go for two to three minutes each, uh, and then we'll have for the discussion. Over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, the question, yeah, the question, the question which was question. in the um, uh, question panel was whether um, with the uh, current administration and the transfer to another administration in the future, whether this will present more difficulties for South Korea's relationship with India. And yeah, I, I believe it will. I think rhetoric is detrimental to bilateral relationships. Excessive rhetoric is detrimental to bilateral relationships. The only rationale for using rhetoric is to focus attention over the short term. But when you have excessive rhetoric, which is going to become an impediment, it has to be avoided. So, for example, at the moment, we've got the UN administration and the UN administration is using a lot of rhetoric, which is, well, let's just say very different from the previous administration and probably very different from a future progressive administration. And so when you have this pendulum swing from one side to the other, it doesn't help bilateral relations. Uh, it acts as an impediment to smoothing out those relations. Um, it's very hard to address this. It's a Korean domestic politics issue. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't go as far to imagine that there is a solution at this stage. But it's something which needs to be taken into consideration, particularly by the foreign ministry, particularly by the foreign policy establishment. Um, I'd like to just touch upon um, the question of the, the concept itself again. So in Professor Ahn's um, uh, speech, it, I, it's very interesting to me in that he gave a definition of what is a global pivotal state as a top 10 economy, a contributor to global norms and a soft power. Now, I'm sure everyone here recognizes that those exact terms are the exact terms to describe a middle power as well. So what's the difference between a middle power and a global pivotal state? I would say absolutely nothing. 
this is all just rhetoric. And that's why we've got to avoid using this you know, too much or getting too concentrated on it because South Korea is what we can call a secondary power, whether we call it a middle power or not, but it's a secondary power. It is a top 10 economy. It contributes to global norms. It has a lot of soft power. And from this position alone, we can understand that it plays a role in global security, global economics, and global diplomacy. And it plays an important role. And that's what we need to focus on in the context of its bilateral relations with India. No, I do agree with you. I think uh, these are interesting points, uh, and particularly seeing South Korea as a secondary power. And I think that's an interesting proposition because uh, had South Korea not been a secondary power, it would not have been uh, so much dependent on the alliance partnership framework, particularly with the US on nuclear to nuclear energy to many other uh, defense and security related matters. And I think uh, there are rhetorical um, visibility is clearly noticed in the South Korea's foreign policy. And I think that really uh, you know, pulls back South Korea to be a, one of the practical actor in the Indo-Pacific regions. And I think India needs to be really mindful about that. Um, from India's point of view, I think you have said it all. I think uh, there is a lot to think about it. Um, and I think uh, this will also interest probably Chiu Ping to comment uh, when the previous uh, South Korean administration was having a new Southern, um, uh, you know, new Southbound foreign policy, new Southern foreign policy, uh, there India and ASEAN were clubbed together. How do you really see that, uh, you know, um, this current UN administration is making a difference and trying to address that in the South Korean foreign policy. Do you see the same kind of much more rhetorical um, foreign policy approaches are still very much visible? Or do you really see UN administration making a course correction or a departure? How do you really see it? Maybe over to you, Chiyopi. Thank you so much, Dr. Jakanat, for your question. So um, I think um, the UN administration did a realistic assessment and the result from the previous administration also shows that by grouping India and ASEAN together, it doesn't mean that they both belong to the same region and there is reluctance from both India and ASEAN side to be put under the same category to be engaged by South Korea. So that was the common sentiment uh, expressed um, during the previous government. So I think the Yoon government took note of that and uh, decided to have separate policy for, for ASEAN and also India. So I think it makes sense in the way that um, there is no um, common commonality that can bring both together. But I do see uh, the role of Indian diaspora, for example. Um, so for example, India, uh, Malaysian, uh, Indians in Malaysia who have Malaysian citizenship actually hold India as the second uh, citizenship or have a special passport to allow them to travel freely. So, um, and there are Well, I think we lost here. We lost her. Maybe she will come back. Maybe Uhel, you want to come come back and uh, you know comment particularly on the technological aspects that Professor Ahn was speaking about. Uh, would you like to jump in and uh, share your thoughts on the subject? Um. Well, I mean, technology uh, cooperation, as I you know briefly in report too. Um, and then, you know, Professor Ahn's, you know, suggestion on, you know, many factors of a technology cooperation is, uh, you know, doable. Um, but at the same time, it is not very, you know, feeding into the market principles. And then Korean, Korean technology firms and the Indian technology firms, and they have a, you know, conflict of interest in many times, I mean, in many, you know, sectors, especially, you know, defense industrial cooperation. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, the shipbuilding industry, the submarine, and then other, you know, the warship, you know, contract, you know, was almost done, you know, uh, for between these two countries. But, you know, this technology, uh, technology transfer issue actually hindered it for these two countries, you know, from going forward. But at the same time, you know, um, many other issues in the, you know, the space industry uh, and then other industries and then, so what we really need to is uh, start from the very you know beginning, um, the scratch, uh, and then just 
we've been talking too much about technological, uh, you know, the cooperation last decade or so, but we what hasn't been, you know, materialized. So what we need to do is just start a step, you know, evaluate the, you know, potential or the possibilities, you know, for these, you know, the, the technological high tech, you know, technology, you know, sectors. But at the same time, you know, pure economic approach is not working. Uh, and then as a uh, professor An, you know, agree with me on this, you know, multi, you know, dimensional, you know, security approach, you know, for this same uh, technological, uh, you know, cooperation, science and technology cooperation is necessary. It is not just a matter of pure economic principle. It's a matter of, you know, national security in terms of, you know, military security, at the same time, technology security. And as I just uh, answered to the, you know, the, uh, the uh, Fajit Lama, uh, uh, you know, in the in the you know chatting uh, you know screen. Um, nowadays, it's uh, it's a uh, it's not you know separate. You know, the Professor An used the amalgamation in the term you know amalgamation of every single you know security you know sectors. Of course, it's not you know from the you know the you know economist point of view, it's not very good to be honest. With securitization of everything is very risky. I admit. But I think it's the 20, 2020s. I think the general direction of the strategic structure uh, of you know global you know security has going that way. The United States is leading the way, and then China is doing exactly the same thing, and then Japan, and then you know the other you know major European countries, and South Korea, Japan, uh, and then India, and Australia is keen on you know the the economic and then technological security too. Canada is doing exactly the same thing. So we are, you know, you know, you know, entering the new era of multi-dimensional security convergence. So uh, if we admit and accept this type of, you know, change of principle, then it's going to be a lot, you know, more plausible for these two countries to move it forward. Otherwise, it will be same next ten years. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Uh, uh, before I come to Professor Parulikar and uh, then Jeffrey and Professor An again. Uh, Chuping, you would like to um, finish your points because we lost you in the in between. How do you see uh, the current UN administration making a transition or a departure or making any difference in the foreign policy approaches in its outreach towards India and ASEAN together? Uh, because in the previous administration, it was clubbed under the new Southern policy. How do you see this link is there in South Korea's foreign policy today in the context of pivotal state, uh, you know, strategy, Indo-Pacific strategy? Do you see that uh, uh, you know the current government really making a sense or still very rhetorical? Yeah, I think they make a distinction now. So with ASEAN, there is a Korea ASEAN Solidarity Initiative, so of which they continue whatever they have from the new Southern policy. And as for Korea India, so uh, in the audience we have uh, uh, Dr. Lakvinder Singh, who is an uh, expert on this uh, issue. So already uh, his research shows that there is so much uh, development between India and South Korea in terms of. Uh, capacity development programs and also including a defense partnership. So all of that doesn't require participation from any of the Southeast Asian countries, for example. So India does have naval uh, cooperation with Vietnam, so as uh, South Korea, uh, Vietnam, but they were re they were developing at different paces. So I think it makes sense for the South Korean government to um, uh, to separate cooperation that um, develop at different pace uh, with both uh, region. Uh, Professor Parablikar, you have anything to add? Yeah, maybe I'll comment on a couple of things. <clears throat> the first really is about what we're discussing now, which is the current UN government's, you know, cartographic reimagination in a sense. Uh, I'm not getting carried away by the fact that every part of the globe has been mentioned. I mean, that is hyperbole at the end of the day. And for somebody like South Korea, which really, I mean, in, in, in many ways remains a secondary power, it, it's, it's spreading itself to 10. But I do believe that this is an important cartographic reimagination where we are now uh, detaching South Asia and India from Southeast Asia. Because there has been this wisdom for a long time that when it comes to the big three in East Asia, which is China, Japan, and, and you know Republic of Korea, ASEAN has mattered. ASEAN matters because for their own economics, their own export, ASEAN has been the key. And everything that comes to the West of ASEAN is kind of residual. And that explains probably why the previous government's, you know, uh, southern neighbor policy or go south policy had lumped South Asia along with Southeast Asia. 
we are now seeing the dynamics change on two counts. One, there is an appreciation of the rise, however glacial. I'm not, I'm not contending that the rise is ascendant, but the glacial rise of South Asia as a result of India's own rise, the emergence of Bangladesh, the importance of Maldives and Sri Lanka in the overall maritime dynamics. So there is a rise of South Asia, which is being appreciated and appraised by, by Republic of Korea. On the other hand, this whole notion where India could become a kind of a, a way station in terms of exports to Africa, which is something that Japan is now beginning to leverage. I think that is also something that probably the Republic of Korea is beginning to see. And I think Seoul going forward will look at that as well as one of the ways to be able to bring in investment into India. So it may not necessarily be only capacitation in India, but India as a way station moving forward into the global south. In that way, both India and South Korea or India and Republic of Korea partner and converge towards being able to build capacity and development programs in the, in the uh, global south. The other aspect is about how do you build a framework of strong bilateralism? At the end of the day, we all agree that for all the, the minilateralism and multilateralism we talk about, it is the foundation is strong bilateralism. And the strong bilateralism can either happen on geopolitics, geoeconomics, or an intersection of both. Given how much you know, Republic of Korea is dependent on exports and given how pronounced its dependency is on China, anytime China becomes center stage, this whole kind of compact is going to fall on, uh, you know, below its own weight. So the whole idea is to talk about a geoeconomic agenda of capacity building, of development partnerships, which doesn't necessarily bring China center stage. That allows any administration in Seoul to feel comfortable with the idea. The moment there is a China factor, then you will get caught up in these ideological oscillations that will come with changes of power every five years. Thank you. No, uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, I do agree with you broadly, but again, uh, before I go to Professor An, uh, I, th I would like to read a couple of those questions which are there. Um, one is from Sarabjit Parmar, who is asking to uh, Chiu Ping to you that uh, you didn't mention about Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, which looks at the counting on the long-standing relationship with Japan and the Republic of Korea. How much would you think that Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy is beneficial to South Korea? Maybe I will come back to you to comment on this thing. But uh, there is a question uh, for Professor An. Uh, from Kanisk Vich, uh, he's asking, uh, sir, can India and uh, South Korea work together on building a new regime or multilateral forum on semiconductors? Like how India and France have worked on the International Solar Alliance for Solar Energy and Technological Collaboration. Is this really feasible um, idea or a true utopian idea? What do you think, Professor An, given your such a tall experience dealing with the India-Korea dialogue at the strategic dialogue and at the official level, dealing with some of these issues at the negotiating table. How do you think um, that whether it is really practically feasible to have a semiconductor forum between India and South Korea, which can set an example for the entire region, particularly linking, uh, linking it with the new supply chain uh, uh, you know, networks that we are talking about? Over to you, Professor An. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Well, I think, you know, Jagan, it's a really marvelous idea and I should bring up to a you know, priority topic in the forthcoming uh, Korea-India strategic dialogue. You know, as you know, well, the semiconductor industry really multi-layered, right? From the, the, the low end to very high end uh, uh, the, the activities. So even chip four, Act, uh, U.S., Korea, Taiwan, and uh, you see Japan are scrambling each other. Uh, which country actually, you know, dominate the, the whole thing? U.S. tried to bring everything in the U.S., including the manufacturing part, post-manufacturing and uh, pre-manufacturing. And uh, so here, South Korea, and for that matter, I think the Japan and uh, the the. Taiwan uh, is looking for sort of the another outlet to increase its competitiveness. In this regard, I think India, you know, having such great talent in the uh, 
AI and uh, you know electrical, the electronics engineers, and the, you see high cone the, the companies. Uh, so I think we should have enough room to discuss, you see, uh, mutually beneficial programs within the semiconductor industry. I'm going to definitely propose a session on the semiconductor collaboration uh, between India and uh, Korea. Thank you very much. Chiuping, quickly to you addressing that question. Okay. Hey, so, uh, yeah, I couldn't list all the Indo-Pacific strategy, but Canada's um, Indo-Pacific strategy in particular is very economic centric. So the primary one is the economic pillar. And when they mention how they would proceed with their Indo-Pacific implementation, it's all about economic partnership, cooperation, investment, and so on and so forth. So I think it is quite natural that uh, South Korea is one of the key partner. And with the mention of Canada, South Korea, and along with Australia, so uh, Dr. Jeffrey Robertson would know that uh, the middle power conception of those uh, countries is also very popular in academic and also policy discourse. So um, I think in a way, um, uh, uh, my um, unintentional exclusion of the uh, Indo-Pacific policy of Canada doesn't mean that uh, it is not important for South Korea and vice versa. Thank you very much. In fact, I will read uh, also uh, Sarabjit uh, Paramar's comment um, uh, on, a, on, a, on a different issues on how to improve India, um, Republic of Korea's relationship. He's proposing that uh, you know there are two, three issues that we need to really look at it in order to improve India-South Korea relation. One is institutionalization of a bilateral exercises between uh, the Indian Navy and the uh, South Korean Navy. Second, He's proposing that, that South Korea could consider joining the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium as an observer and joining one or more pillars of the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, which is a you know, very good suggestion. And I would really support mm -hmm. uh, such a suggestion. The third point he's suggesting is that India could enhance its warship and submarine building capacity um, and capability by engaging uh, yeah, with uh, the Republic of Korea shipyards. Uh, and this is a weak area with many agreements in the past. Uh, that's why we are you know, uh, failing to take this uh, um, uh, relationship between India and South Korea, particularly on the security and defense uh, cooperation uh, moving forward. Um, uh, you know, before we are almost there, but as we started five minutes in delay, uh, I would just uh, pose a direct questions to everyone as the moderator. And probably you could, uh, comment very briefly in one or two minutes. And I think I will go in the same order, uh, like the way we um, you know, went for the panel. Uh, I will come to Professor Ahn at the end, but I'll start with Jeffrey with you first. I mean, one point you made very clearly, along with also some of the other panelists made, is that the concept of the pivotal state is much more rhetorical. I do agree with that. And I think as an academicians, as scholars, we need to see it at, at, a, at, at a critical note. But again, I think uh, um, uh, if I could ask, I think there are many global uh, you know, uh, propositions by many uh, countries are uh, being proposed in their foreign policy, which are very much rhetorical in nature. Uh, look at China. I think if we talk about the Xi Jinping's tenure over the last 10 years or so, nine years or 10 years from 2013, 14 onwards, he has spoken so many rhetorical concepts in Chinese foreign policy. Um, uh, look at India. I mean, um, again, uh, even though there are many practical notes in Indian foreign policies, it's visible. Still, you know, regions in Delhi talks about so many issues, including the current Global South propositions, which will also appear to be rhetorical. Similarly, if we talk about also Japanese foreign policy, both under the previous, you know, Premier Prime Minister, the late Prime Minister. Uh, Abe Shinzo and including the current Prime Minister's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida, they have been talking about so many concepts which are also rhetorical. Similarly, we have seen in the American, but how does this rhetorical foreign policy um, does not really, you know, uh, take the states into having more practical guidance in terms of foreign policy maneuverings? I would like to invite your thoughts and other panelists thought that Yes, these are rhetorical concepts, but within that rhetorical, there is a conceptual formulations attached that the most of the states attach to their foreign policy. And that's how they proceed with their foreign policy. 
Don't you think that's also a useful practice? Uh, we might be critical to the regime of the day, but at the end of the day, the regime of the day has to also execute the foreign policy targets under a conceptual formulations. Uh, it might be flawed, but it also might serve their foreign policy strategies. How do you comment, uh, Jeffrey? Then I'll come to uh, Chiu Ping, then Wu Hel, then Dattes, and then Professor An for, uh, for a couple of minutes each. Over to you, Jeffrey. So uh, rhetorical framing is important for all foreign policy, and it's essential in order to um, sell your foreign policy to your domestic public and to the international audience. But when you create a term such as global pivotal state, which has no meaning, it kind of undermines what you're actually doing. And there's, there's less um, purpose to using terms such as this. The term middle power works just as well. So um, a good example is we have a long history of thought about middle powers. And we have, uh, well, a comment in the, um, in, in the question box there about multilateralism and minilateralism. Um, middle powers do best in multilateralism. That's what they really want. They do best because they coalition build in multilateral settings and they're able to you know, um, build up a snowball of support until they're able to convince more senior powers, more major powers of their uh, positions. But the environment is also important in any multilateral setting. And the multilateral setting at the moment doesn't work. And so minilaterals are the option. It, it's all about um, reacting to the environment. States are bodies, reactive bodies, evolutionary bodies, just as groups of individuals are, just as individuals are. They transform according to their environment. And the failure of multilateralism means that minilaterals is the alternative. And that's what's happening. Um, middle powers, I think, are um, a need to have rhetoric in their foreign policy to frame their foreign policy. But when that goes excessive, when it goes over the top and it uh, deviates from the country's long term foreign policy, I think it's going too far. And I think you end up with this pendulum swing from one side to the other, and that doesn't help foreign policy continuity and credibility as an ideal bilateral partner. Thank you very much. Chopin, your thoughts, please. Yeah, so I think uh, no matter how, like every five years, the policy name will change, or but the core or the essence of uh, the implementation uh, the nature of the institutionalization of the partnership should be there. So I would say South Korea's um, pivotal role uh, should be more agile, adaptive, and also be more proactive in how they uh, react to the environmental stimulants or changes. And as for India's uh, Indo-Pacific approach, uh, I think the core would be maritime because Indian Ocean region is already part of that uh, conception. But however, uh, India has underplayed their role, I think. So uh, they can actually further enhance their role. So Indonesia started to introduce global maritime fulcrum because they do think they carry weight and uh, they are a uh, archipelago state. And for India, they are a natural major power in the Indian Ocean Rim, and there is an IORAF to begin with. And there are multiple partnerships that can already be stemmed from that uh, foundation. So just like what Dr. Um, Datesh has mentioned, from look east to act east, it took uh, India some time to reach there, and uh, the momentum should be uh, built from there as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ohem? Yeah. <clears throat> Now, I agree with you know Jeffrey, but you know one one caveat um Korea hasn't done this type of you know declaration uh then you know going beyond the Northeast Asia and in Korean Peninsula um the previous government actually you know gave us some ideas and some policy you know drives here and there, but you know the last you know previous uh government Moon Jae-in government was successfully you know, implemented, you know, new Southern policy. Uh, and then there was the first time you know, to be really uh, in practice and uh, successful. Uh, and then I think it is, even though this uh, government, Yun Song Yeol government is a different, you know, it has a different orientation, you know, but absolutely the conservative um, um, 
but you know it actually succeeded in um, this you know, new southern policy actually it's expanded uh, up to the South Korea's Indo-Pacific strategic, which is uh, beyond you know Korean Peninsula one more time, and then global pivotal state you know strategy. I know this is a strategic overstretch, uh, but the thing is sometimes you know the country like. Uh, the Korea, which is stuck between um, these four great powers, you know, it's more like a brainwash, uh, you know, you know the the idea for the South Korean, uh, and, and it's good, you know, and uh, you know go beyond the you Northeast know, Asia Korean Peninsula, um, and uh, it's uh, I don't think you know South Korea has the become really you know people to change everything type of uh, you know global you know the security structure, but at least they give a try. For example, number one is South Korea and the NATO relation. Um, South Korea and the Japan, along with Japan and then Australia and New Zealand, get really you know integrated. Or if not integrated, it's uh, you know the connected with you know NATO, and that actually shows uh, you know South Korea's uh, you know intention and then action. Uh, you know President Yoon, along with you know Kishida Prime Minister Kishida and the Prime Minister Aldrich. You know, they will go to the villas uh, in Lithuania next week you know, for the NATO summit. Uh, and then South Korea's defense industrial cooperation with the Eastern and the Central European countries is really good. But another one is uh, South Korea and you know, South Pacific island countries. You know, South Korea actually you know, held in the first summit, mm -hmm. Korea South uh, Pacific Island you know, countries summit you know, last month. Which was pretty uh, one more time is you know you know rhetorical you know declaration of you know South Korea you know try to enter, but it has the implication for Australia and Oceania itself too. You know Australia has a very strong you know intention to you know get the uh, closure and then connect it with uh, you know Korea. So in that sense, this type of thing actually shows you know Korea has some sort of a uh, you know action plan and then to implement. But agree. You know, global pivotal state is just grandiose term, uh, and then very awkward in English, to be honest with you. But it is, uh, you know, uh, has uh, some, you know, good uh, uh, the, the the consequences already in my view. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, quickly, that is maybe just yeah. a minute or so. Yeah, yeah sure. You know, uh, rhetorical, uh, you know, statements will remain rhetorical statements unless they are backed up by two things. One is you need strategic ideation and that strategic ideation has to have a connective tissue with your institutional strength to carry the idea. We will know going forward whether South Korea has essentially put this out here only as rhetorical flourish or are they willing to essentially now start a bipartisan debate? And this is where I believe that there has to be a national consensus. They have to come together and talk about what a rising Republic of Korea would manifest. And that is something that both parties, you know, who will come to power will have to obviously live with and, you know, force it. I say this because I'll give you two examples. One success story of India and one not so much of a success story. Look east to act east. Many people said it's only basically a change of name. But we've seen over the last nine years that under act east, we can identify a number of different strategic initiatives that India has taken, which has integrated India into the strategic architecture of the east. By the same time, when India articulated Sagar, one of the biggest disservices I think that Delhi has done to its own cause is not to back up Sagar with a kind of a strategic ideation that is very crisp. So even the own government doesn't talk much about Sagar. Every now and then they talk about Sagar, but they have not been able to drive the security and growth complex. So I think what it will decide is if uh, you know, uh, uh, rhetorical flourishes will remain flourishes unless they are backed up by what is necessary to conceptualize them. And I think a national debate in uh, in Seoul is very important as to where do they see South Korea, let's say, you know, 10 years down the line or maybe even 25 years down the line. Do they see themselves as a middle power? Do they see themselves as a contributor to you know global public goods? Or do they essentially see themselves only trapped between the dichotomy of Washington and Beijing? Thank you very much. That is um, uh, very good points. Uh, Professor An, last words from you, maybe a couple of minutes. Yes. Uh, first, on the definition of the pivotal state, well, I thought this is our you know, self-anointed concept. 
Uh, I mean, we are inherited from the Nomoyan administration, Korea's role of the balancer between the US and China. And, but here, you know, uh, we can approach this concept from the top down and the bottom up. Uh, I think the, in a functional sense, the bottom up approach is also very much useful. As I said, this uh, even CPTPP and the DEPA was born out a uh, you know, collaboration of very small, the, the mini countries, uh, which uh, evolved into a huge you know, international the, the architecture. So in this regard, the India and the Korea, we can play a lot of the roles to provide the public goods and the uh, international norms. So, and the second question is that, you know, society and the economy nexus issue, and I, I'm not really not sure which, how they interact each other, you know, and, uh, but yet we need to address uh, the security and the economy nexus issue. Uh, can he, you know, separate? No, never, but how they interact. I mean, security comes first and the, uh, as economic collaboration, you know, continues to go on and uh, maybe it can influence the security dimension. Uh, as Professor the big wheel indicated that the, the, you know I mentioned the amalgamation between the CPTPP and the RCEP. Here I approach basically the economic point of view. And the China applied for the membership of CPTPP, and the China said they, you know, they are going through all needed domestic reforms to comply with the CPTPP threshold requirement. If China does that, and there is no reason why, you know, China should not be the member of the CPTPP. China is already a member of the RCEP, so uh, the ideal picture is that the two mega deals somehow need to converge each other in the years to come, well, to avoid the, the catastrophic the confrontation between China and the United States. So I have been advocating all this improvement to RCEP to the level of the CPP, CPTPP. And uh, then another point, uh, the Professor Robertson, you know, you mentioned that the Korea's tilt to the India and the ASEAN uh, will continue even under the progressive regime. Uh, I, I really think so. Uh, especially, you know, India and uh, the, the ASEAN has been a really long friend of the Korea, uh, even the the Moon Jae-in administration, as uh, uh, Panda indicated, that designed a new Southern policy. And, uh, you know, furthermore, I mean, you know, we, we do not have any historical legacy issues between India and the Korea, ASEAN and the, you know, the, the Korea. Therefore, I think the, no matter which government administration comes in, Korea's tilt toward the India and ASEAN will come through. And then the, the, I think the uh, one final point I want to make is that the, as uh, Dr. Uh, you know, Datesh mentioned that the, a strong bilateral relationship is, you know, is, is very important. I really fully agree with that. Although India is not a member of the RCEP at the moment, India is not likely to join the CPTPP in the near future, but nevertheless, uh, the strong bilateral relationship between India and the Korea can be done in, a, in, a, in many respects. It is you know, firmly true that Korea, uh, no matter which government comes in now, we should not put all of our eggs into one China basket. We need to diversify. We need to put the, our eggs in different baskets throughout the whole world. I mean, that's the best way of to, you see, uh, uh, avoid the disruption of supply chain resilience. And that's the best way of to, you know, Korea emerge as a sort of the, as kind of the, so, you know, regional player. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Han. And I think um, you all would agree with me that this has been a fantastic discussion so far. Uh, there are many open questions, many open points still to think. And I think we will continue to engage and discuss this. But uh, for our audiences and participants, first of all, thank you very much for joining and being very patient with our uh, technical glitches that we faced. 
but this happens all the time, as you know. Um, we will be coming out a, with a publication on the on the same issues, covering some of the speaker's perspective. Uh, so you could see this publication sometimes the end of this month or uh, early next month. But we would be, you know, holding some some kind of India Korea dialogue in times to come. Also uh, on on some other issues, we will uh, we will invite some of you and please join us for our future events. But um, on the on on behalf of ISDP, uh, I also. Um, thank all the speakers, panelists here for being patienceful and participating in the event. Also, I greatly appreciate and thank my colleague, Anna Jarmuth, who has been on the background and helping us to address the technical issues, you know, managing the, the PowerPoint and other technical issues. And thank you very much. But uh, wonderful to have you and great discussion. Have a very good day and a great week ahead and see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.